Better get our first speaker up here and going here around the around the 12:32 or so. But I'm Brad Burgerford. I'm a horticulture specialist uh, based out of our Python Research and Extension Center down at Python, Ohio, almost down on the Ohio River. And uh, appreciate everybody signing in today. Uh, we know there's lots of other uh, lots of zooms going on. Matt and I were just talking here at the beginning about how much how much of this is probably going to be the way we'll be doing things into the future. But we know there's a lot going on uh, this time of the year in terms of zoom means we appreciate you all uh, checking in with us and hopefully uh, we got a couple great speakers on on board here for today and I, I know you will leave this uh, this meeting um, with a lot of good information that you can implement on your own on your own farm. So we hold these, we've been holding them uh, now since January 12th, every Tuesday from uh, 12.30 to 1.30. So we'll try to wrap this up around uh, around 1.30 today, um, but there'll be more coming on. So there's a total of six sessions. So uh, the last one will be on February 16th. Um, but I've been working with high tunnels for, for, uh, for many years, uh, probably since the late 90s. And we've come a long way, but there's a lot more uh, issues that we were just discussing before of things we need to keep up on. So um, again, appreciate everybody signing in today. I think we're just getting to be about 1232. So our first speaker today is uh, Frank Becker. He's a program coordinator up uh, for Wayne County Extension. And he, uh, he had Wayne County and his area and his program is probably one of the best integrated pest management programs that we have in the state. Uh, I learned a lot from the folks that were in, in Frank's position before to implement IPM programs down in my area of the state here in Southern Ohio. And uh, we were just brainstorming, we don't know way to know this, but probably per square mile, I would say that uh, Frank's area has probably some of the most high tunnels per square mile um, of anywhere in the state. So we, we don't have no proof for that, but just driving around working with folks, we think, uh, He's got some of the, the most high tunnels. So he has been through a, a lot. He's out on out in the tunnels a lot, working with growers, has seen a lot. And he's going to share with us today uh, um, what he what he's learned and some of the things we need to look out for uh, when it comes to uh, production issues. And there are lots of them. Um, so first of all, though, if you do have any questions as we're going, put them in the uh, question and answer box down below. Um, and we, you won't, you'll be my, uh, your mics are muted. You not, won't be able to say anything, but you can put in all of your, uh, all of your questions in the question and answer box. And Carrie Jagger, she's going to uh, be monitoring those question and answers. So we'll get those uh, answered for you in between, uh, in between uh, um, Frank and Dr. Kleinhens' uh, presentations today. Um, your video, we can't see you, but you can see us. Uh, but it, Again, if you have any problems or questions, put them in that question and answer box and uh, Carrie or, or me or somebody will get you taken care of. So with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Frank Becker, Program Coordinator with OSU Extension of Wayne County and gonna go over some of the production issues that we face when we get into high, high tunnel production. So Frank, I think the floor is all yours. All right, thanks, Brad. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Yep, here you're good. Perfect, all right. Uh, so like Brad introduced me, uh, Frank Becker with OSU Extension Wayne County. Um, and just really wanted to touch today on some uh, common high tunnel production issues that we can uh, work on avoiding. Uh, so just a little background on myself. Um, my perspective in high tunnel production comes uh, based off of several years of experience in, in integrated pest management, uh, as well as uh, high tone production both as a grower and a scout um, so my interest in high tone production really started uh, in high school uh, we had FFA at our high school and I was able to have a FFA project uh, in high tunnel production so uh, since that time through college and now as an extension employee I've spent countless hours scouting and walking through high tunnels all over Wayne and Holmes and Ashland counties in Ohio um, and experienced firsthand the challenges and struggles that growers face. Um, I realize that all high tunnels are different and each grower, you know, they have different practices that do or do not work for them. Uh, but regardless of what farm I was on or the management strategies or practices that were in place, uh, the issues that I'm gonna go over today really seem to be the ones that consistently cause problems. And so as I was going through all these issues, 
uh, the thing that really stuck out to me was that, you know, a lot of these growers that I work with, they know, they know the problems, they know how to, uh, you know, avoid them or alleviate them, but the, the challenge is the follow through um, and actually implementing, you know, correct management strategies. Uh, so this, this quote here came to mind, there's no short, shortcuts to any place worth going. And I really think in high tunnels, um, you know, that, that uh, speaks true. And, and so keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. Uh, so first off, I uh, just wanted to get into variety selection for high tunnel crops. Um, so it's important when we consider what crops we're planting that we need to uh, be aware of trait differences between open field varieties and controlled environment varieties and cultivars. Uh, when you look at seed catalogs, you can find differences. Um, you know, some of those varieties are listed for performance, um, better performance in higher temperatures or uh, certain varieties have different tolerances um, to different diseases or insects that may be present in high tunnels. Uh, another important one that uh, I see a lot of challenges with is determinate versus indeterminate varieties in high tunnels. So although high tunnels are tall, growing indeterminate plants isn't always the best idea when looking at competition for like sunlight. Um, uh, and additionally, when we look at uh, issues with indeterminate plants, uh, you'll get into restricted airflow issues that occur when, when those plants essentially fill any and all open space in the tunnel. So I just took this picture uh, from a high tunnel that I was in. Uh, this grower does a good job of, of making sure that he's got determinate varieties in his tunnel. So those, those plants there uh, really didn't get much above five or six feet tall uh, through the whole season. And then another challenge I see with uh, high tunnel production systems is when uh, the growers kind of uh, get in to these unique or niche varieties. Um, and these varieties that seed companies sell, you know, often heirloom or of the likes, they're, they're not necessarily adapted to high tunnel production, um, nor do they have desirable traits when looking at disease and pest uh, tolerance or resistance. So they definitely have their place in the market, um, but they're not always the best business decision in terms of uh, production or performance in high tunnels. So I'm gonna put up this picture of fishing lures and you might ask what the heck does fishing lures have to do with high tunnel production? So I heard it uh, said once that a company that sells fishing lures, their foremost goal is to appeal to the fishermen in order to get a sale. Um, and so much so that the lure is often more appealing to the fishermen than the fish. So, and you know, I, I, I think this is the case sometimes in some instances with uh, certain vegetable varieties. They appeal more to us as a grower rather than appealing to our end consumer or appealing to our production standards and goals. So this isn't to say that, you know, you can't experiment with, uh, experiment with some of those interesting or different varieties, but uh, certainly don't rely on them to be the end all for your production goals. And then when we get into plant spacing, um, I just pulled these recommendations out of the Knotts Handbook for Vegetable Growers. Um, and these are the recommended row spacings for open field production. Uh, so you, you can see the steak tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. Um, and really keep in mind that in a high tunnel um, system, you really wanna aim for the higher end of these uh, ranges. In a high tunnel, high, dens high density production can lead to diseases and pest issues. Uh, and not to mention, truthfully, the increased difficulty working in the tunnel or harvesting. So space is also dependent on variety. Again, you get into uh, indeterminate or determinate, depends on, you know, that can help um, decide what your plant spacing needs to be. And really where we see challenges is when, um, you know, you're getting transplants in the tunnel. So increasing that plant density too much by, di by decreasing the plant spacing is really easy to do when you're planting and working with small transplants. But what you have to do is keep in mind the whole season um, and consider the area that a full grown plant is gonna take up both the root system and the upper um, foliage of the plant. So I have some examples of uh, what ends up being some improper plant and row spacing. So uh, this first picture here was in early May, uh, clear walking paths, not too bad, maybe a little overcrowded, but um, at, you know, at this point in the season, it really didn't seem like a challenge. Uh, and then the second photo here is in early June. The rows are starting to, the walking uh, rows are starting to really uh, close shut. The air movement was a little less in this tunnel um, at this point in the year. And then 
in late June, we reach a point where uh, <laughs> you, there's no way through this tunnel. The, uh, the grower actually um, stopped harvesting some of these tomatoes just because he couldn't get to them. So when, when we look at this, the, the plant density was way too high in this tunnel. Um, you know, variety selection wasn't the best. You look at these plants here that uh, they're pushing up against the top of the tunnel. There was hardly any air movement um, and, and just really not conducive for a, a great growing environment. So then uh, when we look at crop management and training the crops, so training your crops aids in the overall cleanliness um, and sanitation of the tunnel. It helps maintain a comfortable work environment. Um, you know, like we saw in those last pictures, when you have a high tunnel that's overcrowded, unkempt, it really makes it uh, very difficult to get in there and, and work, um, you know, comfortably. Uh, additionally, the uh, improved airflow really helps reduce disease pressure. Uh, improved airflow also helps pollination, although if you have a crop that uh, you know, needs more pollination help, you need to consider getting like bumblebees or additional air blowers into your tunnel. Uh, when we look at pruning, uh, a lot of high tunnel crops can really be looked at uh, in two sections of pruning. Um, there's the sucker removal typically done in tomatoes and then um, the lower leaf removal on tomatoes uh, as well. So pruning, it needs to be done correctly for it to be effective and knowing and understanding what to prune and how to prune will make this practice worthwhile. So when we look at sucker removal and training, uh, this is not how to do this. So here you can see the central leader kinked over um, and, and essentially being unproductive um, and not trained properly. What we do see trained with the clips and the tomato twine is one of the suckers. And there's another example of that. That central leader just kinked over. It's not gonna be productive. It's not, not um, contributing to the overall production of that plant. And there's another sucker that's, that actually ended up being trained. Um, when we look at lower leaf removal, this uh, has several benefits. One being that the airflow is improved between the plants and through the tunnel. And additionally, um, when you remove those lower leaves, those older leaves are often most susceptible to diseases and removing them reduces the chance of those plants becoming infected. When we look at environmental management in our tunnels, um, one of the most unique things that I saw uh, happen in a tunnel was um, a grower using supplemental heat sources. And my recommendations is if you, if you use those additional heat sources, make sure the exhaust vents are clear. If they are not clear, you'll end up with some ethylene gas injury, uh, also known as epinesty. So this um, epinesty is a downward curling of the leaves. Uh, ethylene injury can also result in flower abortion and stunted growth. High temps and increased light levels um, combined with that ethylene gas can increase the severity of the injury. And um, I'll show you this example here. You can see where those plants have that spiraling downward growth and the whole tunnel looked like this. So the other important thing to note here is all these blossoms that were exposed to that ethylene gas eventually dropped off. So he, this grower uh, in this tunnel had about a two or three week period um, where there was just no blossoms left on the plants and lost that whole uh, you know, set of fruit. And then another thing to consider when we look at environmental management and high tunnels is excess humidity, which I know has been brought up uh, several times in this uh, seminar series already, um, but still it's important to talk about. When we look at excess humidity, we really can run into disease problems. The high humidity provides those conducive environments um, for certain diseases. So in this example, uh, we were in a high tunnel in Ohio uh, and the grower had peach trees in their high tunnel. And sure enough, I uh, left it closed a little too much and, and build up the humidity there and ended up with powdery mildew on peach trees, which in Ohio is really not, not something we typically see. So that was unique um, and, and you know, directed back to that he had his uh, high tunnel uh, closed up and, and was really uh, allowing that humidity to get too high. It's important to note too that high humidity during pollination will cause the pollen grains to stick together and reduce pollination capacity. Uh, it's you know, recommended that you, you have some kind of ventilation, keep that air moving in the high tunnel um, and help reduce the humidity. And then the temperature, uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge in high tunnels is, is when they get too hot. 
Um, prolonged temperatures, um, high temperatures will reduce pollen viability. Uh, blossoms abort, you know, I've walked into tunnels and it's 120 degrees and, and that is just way too hot um, for any kind of uh, plant growth or pollination. So really, and we're not too worried about our high tunnels uh, falling below this temperature um, unless, you know, you're trying to do stuff early in the spring. Um, but in the summer, when the temperature gets that hot, you really need to consider shade cloth uh, to reduce the temperatures in the tunnel or um, some end vents, uh, which I think Matt's going to talk about a little more in his presentation. Um, you know, any way you can to bring those temperatures down and reduce the humidity, get the sides open, um, move that high, hot, hum uh, high humidity, hot air out of the tunnel. So when we look at soil moisture management in the tunnels, uh, you really need to focus on getting water right to the root zone. Uh, this picture you can see, uh, you know, these drip lines are set up and honestly, this would be a good, good practice for uh, growers to uh, do in the spring. Just set your drip lines up, turn them on and, and see how they're going to work, where the water is going to build up. Uh, that can kind of help you gauge on where to put your plants and, uh, you know, what kind of um, impact leaving the drip irrigation on for a few hours is going to have on the soil and the beds. So the important thing to note here is that you want to avoid moisture on the foliage. This goes back to uh, some disease pressure issues that occur when you end up with uh, excess moisture on the foliage of the plant. And then when we look at uh, overwatering, it, it, it really is a waste of resources um, that can result in unfavorable growing conditions, disease challenges, um, blossom end rot. I've been in tunnels where they were overwatered to the point that the cell trays, the empty cell trays are floating up and down the walking paths. Uh, that is just not an ideal growing environment. And then underwatering, it's the same thing. You end up with some blossom end rot, especially in a high tunnel. Um, when you underwater, things can go downhill very rapidly. So in a protect, protected environment, there's no rainfall. Elevated temperatures, you're gonna end up with, uh, you know, really rapid evaporation. So you'll have underperforming plants, blossom abortion, uh, you know, when you underwater. And th the most important thing here is consistency is key. So. The best way to gauge your soil moisture, get a hold of a soil moisture probe, or really just get your hands down in the dirt um, and, and feel what the moisture content is like. Just a note on blossom end rot, it's important uh, to realize that this is a calcium deficiency in the plant and not necessarily in the soil. Uh, consistent watering and consistent soil moisture provide conditions condu conducive to consistent nutrient uptake. And, and really managing blossom end rot is more about managing the water relations. Uh, too much or too little water can compound this problem. When we drip irrigate uh, early in the season, we should do so to promote deep root growth. We need to avoid short and frequent irrigation events as this promotes more surface root growth as compared to deep root growth. Uh, irrigation frequency and time can be increased to support larger plants um, and fruit development later in the season. Growers may need to separate irrigation uh, so that the edges of the tunnels can be differentially irrigated relative to the middle as rain runoff can leave the edges a little bit wetter. And there's an example of some blossom end rot on a tomato. So uh, kind of following along in the soil area, um, when we look at our soil fertility and fertility decisions in high tunnels, uh, you really need to be testing soil annually. It's not a guessing game, don't guess. Uh, I'm in a lot of tunnels where you know, the, the conversation that I, I have with the growers, it's my first question is, uh, you know, do you have a soil test report? And nine times out of 10, it's, it's been 10 years or longer since, you know, they've even had a soil test done in their tunnel or uh, on the soil there. So uh, that is really important to make best management decisions uh, on your fertility um, in the soil in the high tunnel. Uh, another risk that we run with uh, having a high tunnel and, and putting in a lot of fertilizer is salt accumulation um, and, and increased uh, pH levels. So rainfall would normally leach out some of the salts and nutrients in the soil, but obviously this isn't the case in high tunnels. Um, and, and in order to test some of those um, levels, it's a, a good consideration to do some uh, plant tissue analysis uh, that can kind of help you get an idea of what some of those nutrient levels are like uh, in season. So when we consider our, 
uh, fertilizer decisions, it kind of it, it boils down to foliar feeding versus drip uh, fertigation. And there's pros and cons for both. In my experience, I've seen a lot more challenges with um, foliar feeding. Uh, and some research is there to back those uh, concerns that I have. Uh, researchers have found that application of, of calcium sprays, for example, to developing fruits, you know, it's labor intensive. It didn't reduce the incidence of blossom end rot um, and, and might've actually decreased the number of marketable fruits. So growers can consider on-farm experimentation with foliar calcium, uh, but it doesn't appear to be the panacea that we once thought it was. Plant stress and growth, um, growth spurts in the greenhouse appear to divert calcium away from developing fruits and results in blossom end rot. So if growers can minimize plant stress and not over fertilize or overstimulate the plants, um, you'll probably end up with loss, less blossom end rot. Um, when we look at foliar feeding, um, foliar feeding of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium is, is not as effective as soil application of these major nutrients. So Fertilizers are far too often overplied and lead to long-term soil health and fertility issues. Foliar feeding may also increase disease risk because of the water on the foliage, um, and one applied improperly can cause burns and blossom abortion. So here you can see a relatively basic or simple fertigation setup, um, and that gets those nutrients right to the root zone. So my recommendation here is not to attempt to address or compensate for or uh, correct fertility issues in the soil by over applying foliar fertilizers. Um, and the other thing, you know, you don't have to fertigate every time you water the high tone. It's good sometimes, you know, to, to alternate um, or, or just give the plants just plain water. Uh, but the important or the note there is not to over fertilize. So when we get into sanitation and, and harvest practices in the tunnel, this is where I see a lot of struggles too. This is a, a high tunnel that I was in and there you can see a heavy patch of weeds inside the tunnel. And what you can't see in this picture is the three to five foot buffer on the outside of weeds just as dense um, and just as tall. So there's a couple issues here. Obviously this restricts airflow in and out of the tunnel, but then uh, this really perpetuates into years of challenges because those weeds, um, you know, left unmanaged and, and unhindered un, uh, are going to build up a really big weed seed bank in the soil. And that's going to establish problems for uh, years down the road. Another challenge that I see in tunnels is diseases. So this is timber rot. You can see the sclerotia on the stem uh, of the tomato. And when these are left in the tunnel and not removed carefully, those sclerotia drop right down in the soil and uh, can be there for many years and reinfect uh, plants, you know, just next year or, or whenever you get them, uh, you know, tomatoes back in the tunnel. So this diseased um, plant, the foliage, fruit, they can all serve as inoculum for a pathogen to spread um, and, you know, really provide compounding disease issues into the future. And then when we look at uh, the insect problems that high tunnel growers face, uh, this was actually from the same high tunnel uh, that I just brought up with the weed issues. Uh, just outside that tunnel was a potato field. The potatoes dried down, the Colorado potato beetles made their way through the weeds right in the high tunnel. Um, and then a familiar high tunnel pest, uh, the tomato hornworm. You know, when, when we let high tunnel pests go unbothered, um, there's no natural, well, limited natural predators in a tunnel uh, you know, to take care of those pests. So you really need to be on top of them um, and making sure that either they're excluded from the high tunnel altogether or that you manage them accordingly. Uh, we see this, we see that problem too with aphids. Aphids can really, uh, you know, their populations can perpetuate very rapidly. Uh, and then looking at called produce. So this picture was good for the uh, pruning practices, but the sore thumb here is the produce laying on the ground of the tunnel. So calling your produce while picking is a great way to save time in the packing shed, but those calls should not end up on the ground. They will attract pests and they will spread diseases. I don't know how many times I've looked down and seen, uh, you know, tomatoes just covered in botrytis and they just lean them right up against the plant, you know, and all these nice healthy tomatoes right above it. And I just, you know, it really hurts me to see, <laughs> see those uh, nice healthy tomatoes uh, kind of being stared down by those diseased ones on the ground. 
And then the other challenge I see in high tunnels is that, uh, you know, there's really inconsistent uh, harvesting. In a high tunnel, things are going to ripen a little faster, uh, maybe in larger quantities. And it's important not to get lazy um, and keep up with the harvesting because, you know, one of the worst ways to lose yield is, is to overripe, um, you know, conditions. So uh, following up in some soil considerations, we really need to be looking at crop rotations. And, and just in general, soil management is really important in a high tunnel um, just because of the uh, unique conditions that we create. So when we look at crop rotations, it not only helps with breaking up disease and pest cycles, but it can also be advantageous in our soil fertility plans as certain crops um, take up you know, certain nutrients more so than others. So when you look at a crop rotation, it's not only important to avoid planting the same crop over, you know, over and over from year to year, it's even better if you can rotate out of the same family. And then it's also important to add organic matter. Um, adding organic matter back to the soil is gonna add some value to the fertility. Um, Compost is a reliable way to add organic matter back into the soil as our cover crops. So uh, one, one consideration I've seen some growers take advantage of is exposing their tunnel to natural rainfall and the winter, um, winter conditions. So exposing the soil to a natural rainfall will help flush out some of those salts and prevent salt buildups. Uh, you know, this can also be done with heavy irrigation so you wouldn't necessarily have to take the plastic off. Um, but also exposing the soil to the elements and the freezing and thawing in the winter can help kill off some pathogens and expose um, and exposure to that soil during that time can also help break up uh, some shallow hard pans that may have developed in the tunnel. Another important thing, uh, and this can kind of be uh, a pretty uh, basic step when you're designing or building a high tunnel, but you need to really designate beds and walking paths. Uh, when we look at that and you're gonna commit you know, these areas in, the, in this picture, for example, commit those areas to walking paths and these areas for growing beds that really can help cut down on the amount of compaction that occurs and keep those beds, um, you know, in a productive state and keep that soil relatively uh, healthy and, and productive. So when we look at all these factors, um, I really want you to think of each factor like a domino. And when once one of these areas gets away from you, others will follow. Uh, and, and this is because so much of what is going on in a high tunnel is interconnected. So it can all go down hill really fast. I've seen it, I've done it myself. Uh, mismanagement in one of these areas or some of them will result in some disappointing results, frustrations, you know, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a challenge. So there's, there's, you know, your way to think of it as a domino effect. So, you know, when we think back to that slide early on that said no shortcuts, um, Think about what would happen if you try to shortcut, you know, one or some of these areas. So it's important to stay on top of things. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions or for help. High tunnel production, you know, it's, it's very labor intensive and complex, but it can be very rewarding and enjoyable. And it, it's just really all about the effort that you're willing to put in. So with that, uh, I will stop my screen share and turn it over to Matt. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Frank. You, you did a great job. I think we're a uh... We're pushing the wire here. Uh, we've been, again, answer your, uh, put your questions in the question answer box and uh, Dr. Kleinhans and Carrie and other folks on our team have been doing a good job answering those. So I think we'll just roll right on in with uh, Matt's presentation. And then hopefully at the end, maybe we can just do a synopsis of the, uh, of the questions that we've had, but very good job, Frank. I just wish we had a thing we could all like applaud on these Zoom meetings. We don't have that yet. So uh, I'll applaud for you, Frank. So with that, you. Matt, you wanna go ahead with sure. your environmental management? Yeah, yeah let me see yeah. if, uh, I assume that you're seeing my screen at this point, but right now I'm not in screen yep. sharing mode. Um, yep. we see which I need to get into. For some reason, it's not giving me that option. In the meantime, again, some of you are raising your hand in the little uh, emoji thing and that that's just not no. gonna work. So just put your questions in the Q&A box, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess I, I definitely want to echo what what Brad just said about Frank's presentation. It was uh, absolutely top notch, and he set the stage super well for the comments and information I'd like to share with you going forward. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a tremendous range of interests um, uh, represented here today in the attendee list. Uh, a lot of people coming at high tunnel production 
and the associated opportunities and challenges from their various perspectives. And so the purpose of the school is to, and, and from and different levels of background and experience, and the purpose of the school is to do our, is to do its best to address those perspectives and needs and interests um, as well as possible, respecting that, you know, they're, they're, they're very large in number and they're also very diverse. So if you have an idea or a question that is sparked by what is said or what is shown here or in previous sessions or in sessions to come, please don't let the time that we spend together each Tuesday afternoon or morning, wherever you are, be the only time that you communicate with me or another member of the presentation or school team. They all have contact, we all have contact information. You're welcome to reach out to them. You can reach out to me directly if that's just easier. And then I can I can forward, uh, forward your uh, question or co comment on. I just don't, I just want to encourage you to continue the, the conversation with uh, all of us uh, as you would like outside of the boundaries of the school. But of course the, the, the weekly sessions that we have here are uh, designed to uh, not only trigger those ideas that you might have um, and raise the questions that, and address the questions that you might have, but, uh, but push the ball along a little, a little bit further. So I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes or so focusing on steps that you might want to consider taking and enhancing the, the management of the environment inside the tunnel. And Frank did a fantastic job of setting the stage for some of these comments. So where he already covered some, I'm going to go quickly past them, but where he, uh, you know, set a foundation in stone, but I would like to build that I would like to build on that's where we will spend a little bit more time. Okay. So there are a lot of crops and a lot of production situations that all of you represent and could represent going forward. There are a lot of specific how to's to address them. Today, we don't have the time for that. We simply just can't address all the possible combinations that that you um, uh, might experience in detail. So instead, I'm going to be focusing on the principles and the factors to consider when you develop your own plan. And I say MEM for micro environment management. That's just a shorthand, just a little bit of a, a little bit of an acronym to uh, shorten the phrase. So this this next 15 minutes or so is all about factors and you know, principles to keep in mind when you consider your own high tunnel situation, wherever you are and whatever you're planning to do. And the first step to consider, I think, or the first item to consider is that your high tunnel is both a source and a sink of energy. Energy is coming into the tunnel, energy is leaving the tunnel. And we talked about hot air and cold air. Um, Frank mentioned that the tunnel could be 120 degrees in, in, uh, in the summertime during the period of high, you know, highest temperature and, and highest light levels, whereas the outside will be cooler. So it wants to equilibrate um, and you want to facilitate that. The point being that your air temperature, your soil temperature, the temperature outside the tunnel, the temperature inside the tunnel, they're all trying to, uh, all trying to equilibrate with each other and you are in the middle of all that process. And of course, it's your job to facilitate it or prevent it from happening. And I like to think of it this way, is that you know the, the weather outside plus your management of the tunnel set the conditions inside the tunnel. In addition to those conditions inside the tunnel, the crops that you have, crops and varieties that you have chosen with their specific physiology determine the outcome of that whole, that whole relationship. And then the back arrow is, okay, what did you learn from that, from that situation? The weather, the decisions you made on how to manage the tunnel, the conditions inside the tunnel, the crops that you had in place at the time, within the effects that those uh, conditions inside the tunnel had on them, and then the outcomes that you that you experienced, pro, con, you know, good, bad, otherwise. Keeping records will, will assist you um, in, in adjusting your management as needed. And look at, looking at it differently, you know, weather is a huge driver. It's the first perhaps the first gear in the, in, the, in the whole process. And then you incorporate the information you have available to you, the knowledge that you have, the experience that you're gaining in making the decisions on how to manage that tunnel, which then in turn sets the microenvironment inside the tunnel, which when combined with the physiology of your crops, determine their yield and quality and other aspects that are other aspects of your system that are important to you. So, and, and then there's that feedback loop, okay? 
what did I do? What did I do that worked? What did I do that didn't work so well? That would inform your next round of decision making. That's what this is really all about: is taking you from wherever you're, wherever you are, with respect to this um, uh, level of your high tunnel management, if you will, and bringing it up a notch or two to achieve better success. So, the specific aspects of the environment that I'm going to be focusing on are the light, the temperature, the humidity, and the amount of liquid water in the tunnel, and. Your objective is to ensure that those conditions favor the crop at all times, that it that they do not favor pests and weeds or pathogens. And I put the clock in there to emphasize it is around the clock. It's not for part of the day or part of the week or part of the night. It really is a question of if you started a stopwatch when you plant the seed in the ground or put the transplant in the ground and then stop the watch when the crop was finished, how much of that time would the conditions be ideal for your crops versus the pathogen, the pest, or the weed? It's really a function of that uh, basic math, if you will. So we want to ensure that the conditions are favorable for the crop at all times, of course. And this might make you feel like you're trying to solve a Rubik's Cube or play three-dimensional chess against Spock or, you know, solve shot JR. It isn't quite so mysterious. It does take time. It does take some knowledge. It does take some trial and error and experience and it will take you some detective work and maybe in some specific equipment. But those are your paths or your, your resources or your tools towards a higher level of success. And I'd like to just remind you that if you install a high tunnel, you have paid for the opportunity to set up a microenvironment that works for your crops. That's what you've paid for. Otherwise, you'd be an open field grower. But if you've chosen to install a high tunnel, you've committed yourself to creating a microenvironment that works on your behalf. So it behooves you, I think, to be really familiar with the environment that your crops need. It would be sort of like trying to be a doctor and not knowing anatomy or biochemistry or some other, or a lawyer and not know the law. You could wing it but you would only get so far. So this is my, this is the place in which I'm encouraging you to know the biology of your crop plants as well as you can. One does not necessarily have to be bookish about it, but studying them will always help you because those conditions or the biology uh, and what they need changes from their young, young time to when they're mature. And so knowing what this, what the condition, knowing what conditions are optimal at each stage will very much help you. You'll also want to know the baseline growing conditions across your, your year, wherever you are located, the side of the hill, the north side of the hill, the south side of the hill, high elevation, low elevation, windy and open, closed and shaded, whatever your particular situation, know the baseline can growing environment and recognize that crops are not responding to just one factor. They are responding to all factors. After all, they are sedentary. They cannot move from one place to another like all mo mobile you know, animals and, uh, and the like. They cannot seek an environment that is good for them. They must deal with the environment where they are. So they have these elaborate mechanisms to do just that. High light, low light, high light, low temperature, high light, high temperature and so forth. They're responding to combinations. So it's not enough to know what's the light effect. It, it's important to know what is the light and temperature effect if you will. Moreover, some some crop uh, respond to their management, you know, and the yield side, how many pounds, numbers of fruit, for example, or leaf material or roots versus the quality, what your buyers are looking for of that crop. Managing the conditions can actually favor one over the other. You will have to know your preference, your priority. Am I all about yield and a baseline level of quality is, is sufficient or do my customers require a specific quality metric and achieving that metric may require me to get less yield. You might say I want it both. I want both. All We all do, but that is a very significant, it can be a very significant uh, trick or accomplishment. You will also need to ask yourself if you're multi-cropping the tunnel. Most of the, ex the examples uh, 
rightfully so, that Frank shared with us, were from the summertime. Well, what about those folks who are committed to using their high tunnel 12 months out of the year, if at all possible? Many people do. As a matter of fact, some people prefer to use their high tunnel from fall to spring instead of spring to fall, or at the very least, in addition to. So if you're multi-cropping your tunnel, you are likely to have one crop finishing at the same time another crop is starting, but they're in the same high tunnel. How, maybe in the same high tunnel. How will you set the conditions inside the tunnel? Which one will you be favoring? So this has implications to your micro, micro environment management plan. And if you need to prioritize the crops, do so. You can say, look, I, you know, I, I think it's important to manage the tunnel for this crop, not this one at this stage. You might flip that around, but certainly you'll need to know what your priorities are and what they require. And if you look at merging your trial and error and your hard earned experience uh, and some of your detective work, you might want to consider record keeping. In, in our lab, we try to um, uh, be, act on the three statements that are listed there at the, below, at the bottom of the screen. We love to measure things. If we, if we can't, we tend to think that if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. And if we can't manage, manage them, we're just hoping. You know, after all, this is about management. And if it isn't written down, it really didn't happen. Um, now that might be, you might chuckle and say, well, that's, that applies in an academic kind of research setting. But I think it's not entirely true. That would not be entirely true. I think you could conjure for yourself situations in which you would love to have had a record of something, but, may did, uh, but perhaps did not. Now, as I transition into the next portion of this uh, presentation, I'm going to, this is the, this is the portion of the presentation where I think I'm going to be calling you to step up your game in, uh, in a number of different ways. I can really appreciate the truck at the lower left, but the truck that I drive today is not so different from that one. Okay. And the, the modern truck on the right has all the bells and whistles and the very advanced climate control, right? You can get passenger sides, passenger side uh, temperature control driver's side temperature control, different settings for the seats, so on and so forth. You get the idea. I would venture to say that the majority of the high tunnels that we are managing in our businesses resemble in concept the truck on the left much more than they resemble the truck on the right. And I do a, a hold to the idea that if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. But I'm going to give you some examples, I think, in the next few minutes where you might want to reconsider that, I, the, I, that idea. Most of us are managing the environment in our tunnels using the sidewalls, the doors, and the vents. We might have roof vents. Even fewer of us have ridge vents. Some of us might have actually, you know, temperature sensitive pistons controlling our louvered vents on the end walls, maybe in the roof as well, but certainly on the end walls. We might have fans that mix the air and enhance pollination as another benefit. We might be employing vented film or fabric to create, again, even smaller microenvironments within the tunnel. We might be using the so-called glove approach when we do that, individual fingers being uh, an area represented here. But we might use a mitten approach instead where we're covering or not larger portions of the tunnel. And this this, this picture plus the one that will follow it, uh, uh, shared with me by Adam Montre at one time with Michigan State. Uh, look carefully at what he has here in his tunnel, Agrabon covering the entire footprint. And notice what's under the Agrabon. And notice also the sidewalls that have several feet of snow outside of them. So this picture was taken in the middle of winter. And he's using clearly the so-called mitten approach covering in a large track, in a large portion of the tunnel, instead of smaller portions. Both work, both have pros and cons. You'll need to know which one you're going to apply, when and why. Now, this is also, uh, you know, this is the place where I encourage you to take some definitive steps on your own and perhaps with others to encourage the development of new high tunnel designs and add-on components. You might say, I tunnel designs and components, what could you possibly 
mean or why would there be any benefit to that? Hopefully the next uh, few minutes will give you some examples. Um, so what we need, in my view, are modifications of high tunnel design components that allow us as high tunnel managers and crop growers to do our job better. That's what we need. We need tools in our toolbox to manage the environment inside the tunnel more effectively than we can now for more situations that, that uh, for all the situations that people are encountering. For example, for those that like, uh, rely on very early season, very early winter to spring and then fall to uh, fall to winter production in their tunnels, they might want to consider installing what I call a knee wall. A row of wiggle wire track halfway up the sidewall, another row at the baseboard, put on a piece of plastic, and then you vent from only high up, not, not from a ground level where that low growing crop is. And from the inside, it looks like this. And on the outside, when that sidewall is down, of course, it's completely covered. But during those specific periods of the, of, the, of the growing cycle, when you do need to vent for excess humidity or even a higher temperature, when you raise the sidewall, you're going to be venting high, not low. And of course, preventing wind from coming through the tunnel that way. This picture was taken at uh, Sakawena University of Agriculture in Morogoro, Tanzania. I I know I'm not supposed to covet things, but I covet this tunnel. I think it's one of the coolest tunnels I've ever seen. I think it's something that we should have more of in the United States. My understanding is that it was actually designed in Denmark. Why am I so enamored with this tunnel? It has two roofs and one keeps the water out and one lets the air out. How cool is that? How cool would that be to modify that? We put people on the moon into outer space and do all kinds of amazing things. We should be able to have a high tunnel that low, lowers the top roof and raises the top roof. Let out the excess heat and humidity, keep out the rain. Very enterprising folks in Kenya decided they needed to re-engineer their end walls. And instead of having them fixed, they instead use wiggle wire. So during the rainy season, it's covered with plastic. And during the dry season, it's open with mesh screen. Kind of panels for end walls. They take the same approach with their side walls and their end walls. As you can see, mixing screen and plastic. So again, those of you watching from places that are warm and humid um, or don't necessarily have the severe winter, you know, summers that, that uh, others do, this might be very appealing to you. You could, you could say, look, I'm, I'm getting all the benefits of the tunnel from the standpoint of keeping the rain out, but I'm also helping to keep the temperature as low as possible. Shading is always a question, how much, when, you know, when do we put it on? When do we take it off? How much do we do? It's a case by case basis. You have to know why you're doing it and what you're trying to accomplish as to know how to do it. And this is a question of, of uh, I don't have a simple answer for other than to say, know why you're shading and what you uh, need to accomplish with it and, and how sh uh, be confident that the shading that you're, you're intend to apply will actually have that outcome. Is it about light or is it about temperature? Well, if it's about temperature, is there another way to equilibrate the temperature um, as, one, as one factor? We're also looking at changes in the coverings of high tunnels. We're of course more often working with six mil plastic. It's great, but are there other better ones? I think some are on the horizon. Pay attention to them. Just like some systems that help growers like yourself manage the environments in their tunnels without actually being physically present to do that. So many of you, like me, know that sometimes, most of the time, to open the sidewalls or doors, you have to physically be there. Well, this is a system that install that in, includes some autonomous control powered by a solar panel that charges a battery that is linked to a control panel that has sensors in the tunnel that you set the, the uh, you set the temperatures at which the side walls will roll up and the side walls will roll down and the vents will open. All run off of a single solar panel and a battery, both of which are available off the shelf 
and the control panel. Um, so inside the tunnel, it looks a little bit like this. You can set the set points and or set it to manual and the sides will go up and the louver vents will open and close according to those set points barring no particular problem. And I have the, the other arrow uh, here to indicate that this is a, a, a double layer tunnel. So it has an inflation fan that's also powered by the same battery. I'm also become um, been very impressed with the system that we are experimenting with and there are other ones by other companies, but the Hobo Link system by onset allows my team and I to know the light levels and the temperature levels and the humidity levels wherever there are sensors, wherever we are on the planet with internet connection. So we're able to position the sensors where we need them, whether they be high in the tunnel, low in the tunnel near the crop, under a mid tunnel, under a low tunnel, or outside the tunnel, wherever, wherever we are able to position them, wherever we feel like it's necessary, those data are funneled into a, uh, essentially an internet connected box. Those data are uploaded to the cloud. Uh, by the way, the sensors can be thousands of feet from the box, okay? And then whenever I want to, I can log into the site and see the data in real time. It's 15 minutes behind. But if I happen to be somewhere or somebody else that's working with me happens to be somewhere and we need to make an adjustment in our high tunnel conditions based on the conditions inside the tunnel and the forecasting conditions, this system allows us to do that much more effectively, effectively and reliably, okay? Otherwise, we have, as perhaps many of you and we have, learned only from direct experience what the condition inside any high tunnel will be given what we know its condition is and the weather outside it. And we're having to interpolate that in our head and say, I think this is what we should do. But perhaps like you, I've been away from the tunnels, wondering what the conditions were in the tunnels given the local weather and so on. And this system is one in, that allows me to get a glimpse onto that of those conditions in real time. And of course we can pair them, the information we're getting from that system with forecasts or information we're getting from other weather systems. So I'm gonna close with, uh, I apologize to the musicians in the crowd. I am not a musician. I simply enjoy the work that musicians do. I'm going to use the analogy that if we are talking about selecting a high tunnel, it'd be like selecting a guitar, tuning that guitar or setting up that high tunnel in the right way, and then managing the tunnel, playing the guitar in a way that really achieves the outcome that we're looking for. Knowing what that guitar is capable of doing, knowing what we are capable of doing as a musician or a high tunnel manager, we, of course, we need information. Uh, in this case, we need information to help drive us forward. And what I've been advocating here is that some of that information includes what you already have at your fingertips in the way of weather forecasting um, and conditions that you could record either with help of a system like the one I just showed you or, or manually, plus other information you can seek out about what your crops truly need truly need to maximize their yield or quality. Because it's been my perspective for some time that not only in my research, but also on the farms that I visit and, and know about, that decisions around selecting and using various practices and tools, you know, they're not always clear. Like, like Brad said at the very beginning of this session, almost an hour ago, we've come a tremendous distance in our in our high tunnel management, but there's still more to learn. And part of that process is, I think, would benefit from having more information, in this case, I say data, to help us make those decisions um, that will have the best possible outcomes. And I'll just close by saying that that's the very same process that greenhouse growers have been using for decades. They, uh, if you know greenhouse systems, they are very data information driven because after all, they're paying for lighting, 
They're paying for heating and cooling. They're paying for the humongous setup, uh, very by comparison, much more expensive setup that they have than we have with high tunnels. So they are not allowed, not about to allow slop in the system, meaning they're not allowed, they're not about to let themselves undershoot their yield or quality potential. So I would encourage you to adopt a tiny bit of that same kind of thinking when you look at your high tunnels and how you manage their microenvironment and just ask again, what conditions do my crop need? And are they in place as often as possible? So uh, Brad, I'll wrap up there. And uh, if there is time for a question or two, I'll be glad glad to take it. Yeah, we still got another five minutes, but uh, again, great job, Matt. You did an awesome job. And uh, we did, we were trying to keep up with the questions, but there was one that just came across and I was not sure it was regarding the hobo link, the hobo mm -hmm. system that you use. Can those, that same uh, equipment be set up to have alarms go off or cell phone alerts or anything like that, if it would reach a certain temperature? Or yes. Whatever. Yeah. You can, you can receive, um, again, the, you know, the onset reps would, would answer these, uh, that question in detail, but you can configure the system to send you a text alert. Um, you can't, I said 15 minutes. I could, I actually could configure the system to refresh itself every five minutes or, or less if I chose to. Um, and yes, you can set alerts to you know, receive them by email, receive them by text, uh, whatever your, whatever your preference. And that's the onset company. Correct? That's the onset. But again, okay. again, I'm not here to shill for onset, but, uh, we, we've been really pleased with the system. Spectrum has a comparable system. You can shop around if you choose to, but you know I, I became familiar with the onset one and was really thrilled. I have been really thrilled to to begin to you know experiment with it, and because uh, for some of the reasons I just you know I outlined it, we've always wondered what the what the conditions were in the tunnels when we weren't there, <laughs> and you might say, well, don't you know by now? You've been at it for ten or twelve years, and I'd say, yeah, I know I know some things, but you'd be amazed at how, as I'm sure you some of you can appreciate, how different the weather can be. You know 10 miles away so um i'm standing in my house or wherever i am saying oh it's nice and sunny well over at the high tunnel it may not be or vice versa so that's why we're uh we're thrilled with that system and then we just had a question come through uh, somebody was asking uh if you're a master gardener which a lot of our universities have master gardens is there uh locations that they could uh, volunteer get volunteer hours and i would just say follow up with your county extension educator or agent depending on what state you're in and they will, they will probably know the farmers that you could probably volunteer some hours. And, you know, we have a lot of urban uh, gardens that have high tunnels as well. So I think that's a, that's a great opportunity for master gardeners to get their uh, volunteer hours. Um, and then I, the only other one that came across, and I don't know if I got answered right, was somebody, uh, I think Frank was mentioning the bumblebees and somebody said, uh, how do bumblebees make air movement and what the bumblebees do is they just land on those blossoms and just that vibration of the bumblebee on those tomato blossoms will help set the fruit. A lot of my farmers do all everything to set fruit. They want that blossom. They get that blossom that they want to set fruit. So they will have bumblebees. They will tap the wire that your trellis or your string is on to move that. And then yeah. they'll also go ahead and, uh, have a leaf blower that they go up and down and give them plants just the light whip in uh, every morning just to uh, pollinate the fruit. So that's mainly what the, the bumblebees are used for. And then there was another question. We got a minute or two here, Matt. Growing cover crops inside the tunnel that, uh, that can be living cover crops. The, I replied with, it might be an issue with irrigation, but one of the farmers uh, put in the question box about the uh, they use a lot of micro irrigation, so that would not be an issue. Do you have any experience with that? Well, yeah, this is a question that's come up before, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, what you said is absolutely true. I, 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 I agree with that. I would also say that it, you know, in my experience, it's uh, it has been difficult for growers to establish and maintain a living cover crop in the walkways because of the traffic is so heavy. Uh, similarly, they're careful about how much space they give up to a living cover crop. Third, they're concerned about the competition that that living crop actually represents for nutrients and water and so on uh, with their actual crop. And then fourth, there are, cons there are legitimate concerns about whether or not that same cover crop could harbor uh, pathogens or uh, un unwanted, uh, unwanted bugs, you know, pests. So 
uh, certainly it's in a very, very intriguing idea because we're, we're very positive about, about cover cropping and perennial cover cropping if possible and crop diversification. It's just that those pros have to be weighed against the potential consequences specific to a high tunnel system. And uh, to my knowledge, I, I just haven't seen a person successfully integrate perennial covers inside a tunnel for the reasons I just mentioned. Then we got another minute here, but maybe Frank can chime in. A question just came across. Uh, they're growing winter cover crops, but even if it would to get cold enough in the tunnel, I assume, is there anything that will freeze out the bugs? And Frank, being an IPM specialist, I don't know if you want to chime in here, but really we never want to rely on Mother Nature of the winters to freeze out the, the bugs or our insects because it just is very iffy. And those, those insects have that uh, antifreeze in them that just really does not kill them, right, Frank? Yeah, that's uh, basically that sums it up, Brad. You, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're right at our 130 mark. I really appreciate uh, Frank and Matt uh, providing us with that great information. Here we have two more of these. Uh, we go through the 16th. So if you all want to join us uh, next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. And um, we'll also have a 16th as well. Again, appreciate everybody signing on today. And feel free to contact any of us, all of our information or, or Matt's the main contact, you can contact him. And if he um, needs some uh, assistance from us, he'll get the word out to us. So again, I appreciate everybody signing in today and uh, we'll hopefully see you all here next Tuesday. Be well, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good week.